Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final webinar of this year's Navigate webinar series from the Northeast Clean Energy Council and Navigate. NECC Innovation Program. My name is Katarina Madeira and I run Navigate. This series um, is part of NECC's and Navigate mission to support early stage clean tech startups and the ecosystem stakeholders such as incubators and accelerators by providing them learning opportunities about investment and strategic partnerships, as well as connections to investors, corporates, and customers. So if you too want to be part of it, please do reach out. Um, these webinars and, in fact, Navigate have the invaluable support from NYSERDA, MassTC, BNP Paribas, Covestro, Clean Energy Ventures, Mint, the Kaufman Southern Tier Incubator, the Canadian Consulate, and the Roy A. N. Foundation. And we're working to keep growing this list. Um, we work very closely with all of them to design and provide tailored programs and highly valuable connections in that community, because our ultimate goal at NECEC is to drive innovation and accelerate the clean energy sector, and it is a real honor to have such hands on partners. So, thank you so much to all. Um, today, we're here with a fantastic panel of uh, investors and entrepreneurs. Um, we have Connell McKeel from the New York based Startup Energy that will play a double role as a moderator and as a panelist. We have Mike Shimazo from NYSERDA, Madison Freeman from the Energy Impact Partners, and we have Abe Yokel from Congruent Ventures. Um, we're aiming for a very lively and informative discussion of which we want you to be part of. So, as you can see, we have a couple of Q&A moments in the agenda during which we'd love to address your questions. So, please use the Q&A feature on GoToWebinar to send those our way. And now, before, just before passing the word to Connell, um, I'd like to kindly remind you to stay on mute to avoid any sound problems. Advise you that um, as soon as we wrap up the conversation, you will receive a very short survey about the session because your feedback is very important for us and our funders. And last but not the least, please tweet with us using the hashtag NECC webinar. Um, and now, without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to hand over the webinar to Connell McKill, CEO at Energy. Connell, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, be moderating. Um, looking forward to an active and engaging discussion. Um, just briefly to open it up, um, you know, for the last decade, um, I've been building a company in the space called Enerative and raising capital uh, both here and for many of the entrepreneurs building exciting clean tech companies, the goal of uh, changing the world, um, have, have found it challenging to um, get their companies funded. Uh, and sometimes it feels like uh, we're in fact paying for mistakes that were made by uh, other funds and founders uh, that came long before us. So just a brief history of funding uh, in this space. Um, Back in 2006 to 2008, uh, over a billion dollars was poured into uh, clean tech companies uh, and nearly 200 early stage companies were funded. Um, but unfortunately, uh, some of these, many of these investments began to uh, flop. And so what's been referred to in the past as the clean tech bubble uh, abruptly popped. So since 2009, um, VCs have uh, funded uh, about 25 or less uh, early stage, so Series C or Series A um, companies per year. Uh, but what I'm excited about today with this conversation is uh, <laughs> there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there are a lot of great new capital sources that uh, entrepreneurs can take advantage of to get their early stage technology companies funded. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, here today. So I'm joined um, I'm joined by Madison Freeman uh, from Energy Impact Partners, Michael Shimazu of NYSERDA, Abe Yogel uh, of Con Congruent Ventures, 
and Katarina, who um, you just heard from. Uh, Katarina, could you please pull up my uh, slides? Okay, so just a brief background uh, about Enterative and my fundraising story, and then we'll move on to uh, the venture capitalists and funding sources, uh, my colleagues that are joining me today. So um, I launched Enterative back in 2011 um, as a company that wanted to bring radical transparency into uh, energy usage at the equipment level. Um, today, we're a very different company, but leveraging technology that we've been building since our inception. And we're a real estate technology business, uh, about 25 employees based in Manhattan. And we look to, um, by leveraging an IoT platform, streamline and automate um, the existing workflows which exist uh, within commercial real estate properties. So in short, we're using data to help with energy management, uh, to drive more efficient maintenance processes, to give landlords transparency into uh, how their uh, building staff and vendors are performing and to help them um, make better decisions around CapEx and OpEx uh, investments across their portfolios. Uh, could you jump to the next slide, please? Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so just a quick uh, background on our funding history. Um, we launched Enterative in 2011 out of the NY Eastern New Venture competition. Um, we raised a friends and family round uh, that helped us build our initial prototypes, both our hardware device as well as our uh, software platform. And in 2013, uh, we were actually one of the first um, energy related companies or clean tech companies to get accepted into that next slide uh, that you were just on, be perfect, um, to get accepted into Techstars. So when we were in Techstars, we were really focused on you know, developing a turnkey IoT solution that we can sell through channels like utilities and energy services companies. Um, but what we realized very quickly was that we were trying to do too many things at once and that we needed to build a more tailored solution for a specific market. Um, so in 2016, we joined the Metaprop Accelerator here in New York City, a prop tech accelerator to figure out if um, commercial real estate would be a good market for us to sell to um, directly. Uh, and in fact, it was. Um, so, you know, fast forward a few years, um, Fifth Wall came on board uh, and led our seed round. And today uh, we've captured nearly 7 billion hours of asset performance data for more than 60 of the largest and most innovative uh, commercial real estate portfolios um, across the US. Next slide, please. So um, we've raised about $8 million uh, since our inception. Uh, we've had you know, numerous, we, we've had uh, friends and family help us out in the early days. Um, we've had numerous uh, convertible notes. Um, and a priced seed round. Um, and right now we're working on a priced Series A. Um, we should be making an exciting announcement uh, about that shortly. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, some of my quick sort of high level pieces of advice is um, it's really important that when you're talking to uh, VCs, you're, you're put in the shoes of an investor. Um, when you're having conversations about funding your company, it's a very different conversation than you're likely having with your customers um, about the products that you're building. Venture capitalists want to know uh, not only you know, how great of a product you're building, but you know, how big the market is, how quickly uh, you can tackle that market, and what the value of doing so is. Um, also on the next step, um, I would say, especially in the clean tech uh, industry, you wanna operate as lean as possible. Uh, a lot of founders will um, you know, uh, 
really look at how much capital they've raised over time as an indicator of how successful they are and how successful their companies are. Um, but, you know, there, I see just as many companies who've raised, you know, hundred plus million dollars fail as I've seen companies raising, you know, less than $2 million fail. So if you're in the market for capital, um, you know, raise an amount that's tied to your near term business goals and objectives. Uh, you probably want to raise enough to get you through about 18 months uh, of growth um, and your investors, you know, will want to see that in your plans. Uh, but I would just say, be careful and uh, try not to uh, overdo it. Um, and yeah, so those are those are some sort of high level pieces of advice that I threw into a slide. Uh, we'll cover more uh, as we move forward. Um, but now I'd like to uh, hand it off to um, my colleagues on the panel. Uh, so this is Mike Shimasu from Viserta. Thanks very much, Connell. Um, so NYSERDA um, is New York State's clean energy and innovation agency, and we are charged with um, delivering on New York's, by, by most measures, nation-leading uh, clean energy policy goals. Next slide, please. I'm part of a unit within NYSERDA that's uh, known as the innovation team. Uh, our mission is to accelerate the pace of innovation and reinforce New York State as uh, the best place in the world to start and scale a clean energy business. So this is in recognition of the fact that the um, the goals that New York State has for so for example, 70% um, renewable energy by 2030 and 100% clean um, electricity by 2040. These goals are extremely ambitious and they do require a significant amount of innovation. They require solutions that are not currently in the marketplace. Now, it's true that there are uh, solutions in the marketplace that, that can uh, uh, get us on the path there. But to fully get to these, these very ambitious levels, uh, we're going to need more. So that's what we do in the, in the innovation group at NYSERDA. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, our, our corner of NYSERDA uh, is deploying about $800 million uh, over 10 years. And these are uh, what we call direct investments, which are uh, direct uh, funding for clean energy companies and wraparound commercialization support. Uh, these investments are focused on the areas of advanced buildings, uh, which are, you know, very much in uh, very much in evidence as part of New York State's uh, energy mix uh, or energy consumption mix. Clean transportation, which is also a very significant um, contributor to greenhouse gases. Uh, re optimization of renewable energy resources and energy storage. Uh, and smart grid systems and for distributed uh, integration of distributed energy. Uh, again, we wrap around the, these direct investments in companies, if you like, to with uh, commercialization support through our tech-to-market programs. And these involve things like accelerators and, and incubators and um, proof-of-concept centers, um, uh, venture capital matching, and uh, matching with, uh, with uh, entrepreneurial mentors. Uh, most of this support is aimed at pre-Series B uh, companies uh, to uh, de-risk their technology and validate their market uh, and help them build teams. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of our active projects, we, we do fund companies on a project basis. In terms of our active projects, you see that most of the uh, the majority of the support, a bare majority, but a majority of the support is actually in product development. And uh, for those of you who don't know the history, NYSERDA, our middle name is research and development, energy research and development. So that's that's kind of our that's kind of our history uh, and our heritage. So we've focused a lot on product development and on demonstration of uh, technologies that are developed uh, developed here in New York and and elsewhere uh, that can make an, a clean energy impact in the New York State market. Um, and next slide, please. So uh, overall, our innovation portfolio uh, has uh, the companies in our innovation portfolio, that is, which is to say those that are, have been in our incubators, 
like Connell's company and uh, and those who have uh, received direct support uh, from NYSERDA have, have raised about a billion dollars in private capital over the last 10 years, uh, $200 million in project finance capital, and have also received uh, follow-on grants from entities like ARPA-E and, uh, and the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, amounting to about $350 million. And we, we really uh, point to this um, leverage as, you know, for for our own uh, purposes as as indicators that uh, we think at least we're we're on the right track. Um, adding to that is a new program that uh, that's that we call our co-investment fund, and this is quite new. It's only been on the street for a couple of um, a couple of months. And under this program, uh, companies that have closed investments from uh, what we call qualify investors can apply to NYSERDA for additional co-investment um, for up to $500,000 in non-dilutive funding. So we're not really co-investing on the same terms as the qualified investors. So non-dilutive funding from NYSERDA. Uh, the key here is that we are we're looking to leverage the due diligence from these uh, from these qualified investors uh, in order to help us make make the decision reduce further reduce the risk uh, in those relatively early stage investments uh, and and perhaps give a little bit more runway uh, to the companies as they as they prepare for their next round of investment. Um, there are currently fourteen. Uh, uh, investors who are qualified and 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 we are consistently uh, receiving applications from investors uh, to become qualified. Uh, the 14 uh, include uh, Braemar Energy Ventures, Clean Energy Venture Group, uh, Greenbacker Labs, uh, Prime Impact Fund, Spring Lane Capital, uh, and others who uh, who have demonstrated um, both uh, clean energy domain expertise and uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and solid investment track record and so forth. Um, the funds available for our co-investment fund at this point are $6 million. It's not that much when you when you think about it, right? We're talking about $500,000 per, per co-investment. So we're talking about 12, and we have 14 uh, investors qualified. So we do have an expectation that that um, that this uh, program will be recharged with additional funding, um, but we'll, but we want to see how well it works first. So that's our co-investment fund. It's the newest uh, opportunity uh, from NYSERDA. And with that, I'll um, I'll uh, yield to uh, the uh, the next presenter. Looks like that's me. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Abe Yokel, managing partner and co-founder of Congruent Ventures. Um, next slide, please. So Congruent Ventures is a early stage venture fund exclusively focused on what we define as sustainability. There's a ton of overlap. Um, just to take a step back here, you heard from uh, Connell on the entrepreneur side, you heard from Mike on the uh, NYSERDA side. Um, which is a, a phenomenal example of a really well-run policy uh, and, and funding mechanism through New York, obviously. You're going to hear from me, which is uh, representative of some early-stage investment with a venture mentality. And then I believe you're going to hear from Madison uh, on the later stage energy side of things afterwards. So you've got a nice progression here. Um, we do focus on the earliest stages of capital formation within sustainability. Uh, anything that has a positive energy or resource impact is fair game for us. Uh, we tend to define that within four broad themes. The first is around the energy transition. Um, that is everything from fossils to renewables and centralized to distributed. Um, the second is often food and ag, um, and that is everything from food systems uh, as well as agricultural innovation. Uh, the third is around urbanization, mobility, the built environment, uh, and everything within that theme. And the fourth is around sustainable production and consumption. Uh, we've recently rebranded that last piece. We used to call it uh, industrial innovation and supply chain. Uh, but really, it's everything about how we consume, how we move goods, and how we produce them. Um, I I've personally been investing within what used to be called clean tech now for coming up on, I guess, 17 years, which is a little frightening. I was 13 years at a, at a large clean tech fund actually based out of Boston that opened up the Sand Hill office for us in 2007. And so as Connell was referencing earlier, 
have watched the progression um, from kind of the being the old stepchild of, of venture back in 2004 when I started uh, uh, doing this um, in the energy sector to watching the mainstream venture funds in Silicon Valley at the time start ramping up and getting uh, a lot of interest into the sector. Things progressed in a fascinating way from until about 2008 when everything blew up. Uh, everybody stopped funding everything in all venture and the recovery within uh, clean tech at the time did not occur uh, and there was a tremendous amount of capital loss. So the, the congruent story is very much about that, which is, you know, I, uh, I, I was with Rockport up until the end of uh, 2016, which was the old fund I was, uh, I was a partner at and came together with uh, one other partner of, uh, who's at Prelude Ventures to refocus our attention on the earliest stages of capital formation. What we mean by that is we will oftentimes lead anywhere between kind of a 250K up to a 5 million, sometimes more round in pre-seed seed or series A. Our check sizes tend to be in that kind of 250K range up to uh, a million to a million and a half that will expand over time um, as our fund structures change. Uh, we, we've only been around since the beginning of 2017 uh, we, we've made 25 investments across these themes. Um, we are based out in, in San Francisco, but our portfolio covers uh, the entire U.S. In fact, uh, I think less than a third of our companies are actually in the Bay Area. Next slide, please. So this is this is a bad thing, not a good thing. Um, O'Connell actually referenced this. Um, this is a direct data poll without a lot of tweaking from Bloomberg New Energy Finance's uh, data set. Um, on the far left side, what you will see are, is all asset finance uh, in gray. And on the bottom in orange, you'll see the combination of venture capital and private equity. Um, and this is by dollar deployed from 2004 through last year. Um, in the middle, you will see a breakout of that lower left orange chart. Um, we have defined early stage rounds here as any round that is less than $15 million um, as a first uh, institutional round. Um, you will see, as, again, this is by dollar, kind of what looks to be a tapering of dollars over time with a lot of noise in it. You can see the run up in general in, in kind of venture capital growth and private equity dollars from 2004 through 2008. Then you see the massive bust. And uh, now you actually see a nice little recovery in 2017, 2018, which is a good thing, but focused on the late stage. And then if you go on the far right, this is the early stage deals by deal count, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, their data set's great. It doesn't capture typically the smallest investments that happen. So this is directionally accurate, but you know you might not believe the exact numbers on this as it applies to early stage capital into the ecosystem. And this is specifically for clean energy. There was something like 25, 26 deals in this data set for 2018. So despite the mechanisms that you're hearing about today, this area is generally underserved. Uh, I would say this is bad news, but the good news is, is you're getting a lot of attention now, I think, um, from groups like NYSERDA, from groups like Congruent and uh, CEVG and others. Um, and there is more capital moving back into the earliest stages of, uh, of funding this ecosystem. Next slide, please. This is just the, the, the little congruent uh, advertisement. It uh, looks like, like the uh, formatting got a little messed up. But uh, in the last three years, we've made about 25 investments. It'll actually be 27 by the end of, uh, of this year. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of activity, despite the fact that the average investment is only is less than 12 months old at this point. Um, we've had a whole host of companies uh, in the portfolio raise follow-on rounds. One of the core parts of the mission of Congruent when we formed it uh, was to bring in investors who actually don't care about sustainability. Um, and, and I'm going to come back to this later, but we view our mission as bringing a venture tool set to this ecosystem that, uh, that the Congruent team knows well and try to help build venture backable companies that will attract outside investors that want to invest in a good company and don't really care how they are focused. It's a little bit at odds since we're fairly mission driven, but our general belief is that if we can succeed in bringing outside capital with a traditional venture mentality into the ecosystem to help push growth, that is going to be our highest impact activity is actually attracting outside capital. And this is kind of our measurement of that. We, we have ended up um, 
with actually, I think it's not as of Friday, it's now 93 co-investors. Um, we have tended to uh, lead uh, the rounds that we have put together, um, although we're very happy to follow when there's a high quality uh, financial lead as well. Uh, and this also accounts for those rounds that have come together after the companies, uh, after the rounds that we put together. So if we do a Series C, then this would account for those coming in in the Series A. Next slide, please. And this is just a quick snapshot of our portfolio to date. Our run rate has been about eight to 10 deals a year. Um, in the first fund, we'll have somewhere between 30 and 33 deals. Um, so as you can imagine, we've got about another five shots on goal or so. We've got some formatting issues on this one. Apologies for this. But um, you can see that it, 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 if you, this is kind of a, a time progression of the investments we've made uh, over the last two and a half, three years, um, rather than organized by category. We take board seats on about a third of these. Um, we're not dogmatic about it. Uh, we're very happy if somebody else as an institutional uh, investor takes a board seat. In many of the cases, about a third of these as well, we may be the most active institutional investor, uh, but there may not be a board yet. So this is with a you know safer or a convertible note. Oftentimes there's not a, a specific governance structure put in place and we're fine with that for the appropriate stage of company. Um, the, the last kind of statistics in this area, we were lead in just under 70% of the companies that uh, that we invested, and that includes co-leads. Um, and we were amongst the first institutional capital into these companies in uh, just over 80% uh, of, of the investments we've made. Uh, and, you know, that's the, that's the congruence summary. I, I think uh, you'll enjoy hearing from Madison as well here as she covers the later stage side of the business. Sure. Thanks, Abe. Um, so I'm Madison Freeman. I'm with Energy Impact Partners. We're a growth stage venture capital fund, um, and we're backed by a global utility coalition, which is kind of a, what sets us apart, which I can get into a little bit as well. Um, I think just kind of generally, you know, we have about, uh, we raised a fund sort of following, similar to Abe and Congruent, following the, the clean tech bubble bursting. So we've been investing for about four years um, with about a $680 million fund which has largely equity, but we also have a small debt fund within that. Um, and we generally invest around a Series B. So we're coming in with a check size of around 10 to 30 million. Um, so we generally look at companies that are down the road from Congruent and from NYSERDA. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess the other only other thing there is that we're, we're based in New York. We've got an office in San Francisco, but we invest all over North America and Europe. Uh, next slide. So what sets EIP apart is that we've built a utility coalition um, as strategic investors into our fund. So about 80% of our funding comes from a series of largely electric utilities um, as our LPs alongside a couple of uh, engineering firms and, and mobility firms. Um, and so those utilities provide you know, the capital, but the, the large benefit to having them there is that they provide the sort of strategic lens into the industry. Um, they're interested in innovation, they're interested in engaging with innovative startups, but generally utilities are not the best at doing so. Um, and on the other side, you know, there are a lot of startups out there who would love to have utilities as clients, but generally typically struggle um, to, to engage with utilities, to secure partnerships with utilities, to get utilities as long-term customers. You know, utility sales cycles are so long and they can be very risk adverse. Um, so our goal is to kind of sit in the middle as a strategic investor where we can provide this, you know, eyes and ears on kind of both sides, this collaboration between startups and between utilities um, and kind of help them both move forward in a way that's productive. Uh, and ultimately by creating these partnerships between our portfolio companies and our utility LPs, we can also, you know, make Good, good financial investment. Um, next slide. So these are our uh, our fund one strategic investors. Um, they're utilities from kind of all over the world. We have AGL in Australia, National Grid, who does operate in the U.S. but is also in the U.K. Um, Fortis in Canada, a couple of others that are that are global. So there's definitely a larger focus just beyond the U.S. and and looking at you know, how can utilities not just respond to 
the energy system becoming more decarbonized, decentralized, digitalized, digitized, disruptive, but actually be kind of out in the front of that and be innovators. Um, and on the other side, of course, you know, there, there are so many clean tech firms out there who in, in many ways would benefit with engaging with utilities and being able to kind of dig into that sort of institutional infrastructure. Um, next slide. So uh, these are the investments we made so far in the first fund. So there's about 30 investments. Um, we've had a couple of exits so far with Ring, um, Green Lots, and Tendril and First Fuel. Um, and so, you know, I think this kind of shows the breadth of areas in which EIP invests in. We do everything from sort of, you know, very kind of classic distributed energy resources or renewable management, uh, renewable energy, you know, re response or management, all the way to um, sort of more core utility concerns surrounding cybersecurity with digital assets um, or, you know, data management with increased sensors on the grid. Um, all the way to kind of more standard operations, like trying to help utilities find new solutions for resiliency. Uh, and then also on another, on the other side, we also do customer work. So that's kind of everything from direct residential customer engagement through investments like Arcadia, like Ecobee, um, to engagement with cities and sort of seeing smart cities as an opportunity for utilities to kind of be at the forefront of new technologies. We've made a couple of investments in that space as well. Um, next slide. And so our method really revolves around having this engagement all the way through the process. So I sit on our strategy team and we work kind of pre-deal in, in helping utilities or helping understand utilities problems, um, areas that they're looking for new innovative solutions in and areas where there might be a potential opportunity for investment. Uh, we'll collaborate with them as we go out and talk to companies in particular spaces and kind of have a more methodical way of communicating with companies in a specific area, whether that is, you know, one particular part of the smart cities ecosystem or, you know, if that's uh, data management, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and then we also, once we've made an investment into our portfolio, we have an innovation and commercialization team that works exclusively with our portfolio companies and our utility partners to kind of find opportunities for portfolio companies to operate in the utility ecosystem. Um, we've also made investments in a number of companies that didn't necessarily work in the energy or the utility space before, um, but were, we kind of brought into, into the fold. And so on that side, once we've made an investment in companies in our portfolio, the portfolio helps the utilities um, by you know, all the kind of things listed here, providing innovative new solutions. Um, and helping to kind of drive drive utilities forward. Um, so that's that's kind of my overview of EIP, but I'm sure we'll get into a few more details there as the conversation goes on. Okay, excellent, Madison. Uh, well, this is Kyle again, and uh, now we're going to move into the next segment of this webinar and uh, walk through a bit of Q&A. Uh, we wanna make this as helpful and as valuable to the audience as possible, so please, uh, do chime in with questions. I see a couple coming through now. Um, and in the spirit of uh, really work, uh, working with the audience, I'd actually like to start with an audience question. Mike, this one is directed um, towards NYSERDA. Um, the question is, uh, do, does NYSERDA's co-investment fund only apply to companies that are located in New York State? Yeah, um, we appreciate that question. Uh, and the answer is is no. Um, certainly companies that are located in New York State uh, are eligible, but we're really looking for companies that have an impact uh, in New York State. So a company that is expanding uh, its market um, in, in New York State can be eligible. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, Dave, this next question is for you. Uh, thanks for sort of highlighting the capital. Let's uh, going into uh, the clean tech space, um, going back as far as 2004, and it does look like there's more capital coming in as of late, especially uh, you know within the within growth stage companies, um, which Madison and her team focus on. Um, what do you think is driving that? What's what's causing more capital to come back into our space and to look closely at these businesses? In the past, you know there were concerns about development cycles and um, you know, the, the amount of uh, uh, the capital intensity required to get a lot of these clean tech businesses off the ground. 
What's changed? It's a good question. If we had three hours, I'd give you the whole answer as I've seen it. <laughs> uh, I, the, there's a bunch of things that have changed. So, you know, taking a step back, I think culturally, particularly as, uh, as demographics have changed, and, you know, frankly, the last three years of climate news, uh, as well as kind of the reality of our climate situation, have, has begun to sunk in. Um, with institutional capital providers, as this is kind of our general LP set. Uh, and that doesn't mean that there are good investments, but it does mean that people are refocused on the problem. That's one data point. The next data point I would say is, this is a little bit of an of a institutional nuance, but the typical way a venture fund is put together is, a, is usually a 10 to 12 year fund life. Um, and what happens is LPs, our investors will come in and they will allocate capital for that period of time and then they start forgetting about things that have happened uh, beyond that time. Well, the last series of allocations that went into venture capital for sustainability and, and used to be called clean tech, as we said, um, was really in 2008. And we're now in 2019, coming up on 2020. So the, the scar tissue is beginning to heal, I think, in the institutional world. Again, that doesn't mean that there are good investments to make, um, but it does mean that people are now open to the conversation. The last and most important part from my perspective is that um, we do think that the game has changed, actually. So the same thing that has propelled uh, companies like Connell's uh, in general about using distributed sensors and the latest generation of technology, deploying those things towards these general challenges and markets, software is eating the world. Um, and if you're not thinking about how that interplays with the physical world, uh, then, then you're probably missing something. And so even if it's not by intent, uh, a lot of venture capital, even if it's not dedicated to this sector, is now paying attention to trends that matter to us. It has also gotten just way cheaper to build a company in general. Um, despite the rising cost of labor, banning up a company, uh, company and its infrastructure from legal to accounting <laughs> Uh, to if you're doing anything uh, with software it is just so much cheaper and you can make so much more progress with with fewer dollars um, it is predisposing people to look at companies that uh, that affect these areas one last comment on this question venture still does not fit for a good portion of very important solutions that uh, that fit within energy and clean tech um, there are still a lot of fascinating and important problems to solve that venture capital is just not a good tool set for. And so what we're seeing is we are using the venture tool set to apply to a subset of those companies that will have an impact. Once those companies actually demonstrate some traction at the Series A and Series B, it has been a lot easier today and the last couple of years to raise that Series A and Series B um, than it was you know, over the last 10 years. Um, there is a, there is more and more capital that is being deployed after you have real proof points in the business. We're not yet seeing that as much with the venture tool set at the early stages, which I think is bad for the ecosystem. And of course, we see as an opportunity as a fund. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Madison. This next question is for you. You covered a little bit of this during your uh, presentation, but uh, I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about how uh, EIP uh, got started and what the original intent was for the fund? Sure. So EIP, the, the, the kind of idea for the fund and the idea to focus sort of on the future of energy and approach clean tech in partnership with some strategic investors and potentially with some utilities was kind of floated around about five years ago, um, five, six years ago. And the original kind of mission or intent was that we would uh, invest through some SBIC matching funds through a program that was open with the Small Business Administration um, and that we would then kind of find some utilities to partner with um, but through testing the waters with one initial utility partner, Southern Company, um, we actually found way more interest than we expected among utilities in investing and being part of a fund that would really help uh, startups get to the point where they could really actively work with utilities um, and work with a broad range of utilities. So the, the kind of original idea um, got shifted around slightly. And then now, you know, a lot of the focus is kind of 
building this bridge between the startups that might not necessarily fully understand the utility customer. And that's often, you know, kind of the gap that we see is that people are either, you know, have a great solution and are interested in selling to utilities, but are just don't have the um, the sort of a deeper understanding of kind of how a utility operates that they would need to sell into them, or they've kind of avoided working with the utility just because it can be so challenging to do so. Um, so we eventually built out this large utility coalition that I mentioned earlier that kind of addresses a, a, a number of these different issues. Um, but it kind of came to came together just through some finding that interest um, that was much more than we had expected. Great, and Madison, just to follow on. So you mentioned that EIP is a is focused on growth stage companies. Um, you know, for the entrepreneurs in the, in the you know, virtual room that are just getting started, what are you looking for? You know, from a revenue perspective, what what defines a growth stage company? When when should they reach out to EIP for their first meeting? Sure, and I should say that we're pretty flexible. And we you know we would probably officially say we're stage agnostic. Um, we've definitely invested in some pretty early stage companies. We've invested, you know, all the way down to like a series Z. So we're pretty flexible with where we invest. We just generally tend to gravitate towards that series B, sometimes a series A, since that tends is like is our is our comfort area, but is also the area that we think we can have the most impact. Um, because we can you know, leverage our coalition and leverage our experience with companies in that stage. So I think kind of what we, we would generally look for there with an average company um, would be, you know, having having a clear understanding of the exact future of the company, not just not just an earlier idea, but having some traction to demonstrate, you know, a number of pretty either successful pilots or full-fledged projects with ideally with larger institutional customers um, and also just having that kind of vision to say here's exactly where we would fit into this market um, so I don't think there's no specific number there but you know we generally have gravitated towards companies that have a, a couple million in revenue and have sort of started to establish themselves Great, um, thank you. So, so this one's for Mike. Mike, I think we've known each other since about 2011, um, and I've always sort of thought of it. I served a, uh, as a group that has um, has put together some great uh, accelerator and incubation programs for early stage clean tech companies or sustainability companies. Um, and it was one of the few places to go in New York uh, at that time. So. Uh, back then, it was really about the incubation, and also, um, you know, and I sort of would put out opportunities to uh, grant opportunities to get funding for specific projects. But now, uh, it looks like you're um, starting to invest directly into startups. Um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about that, and there have been some questions from the audience about where they can find the list of qualified uh, investors and how they can add their investors to that list. Yeah, so, <clears throat> pardon me, yeah, Connell, um, yeah, that was an interesting time back in 2011, uh, wasn't a, was a, it was a challenging time, as I recall, and yes, we did have those, um, those PON opportunities that focused mainly, uh, you might recall, on technology development, and I think it's, I think it's accurate to say that uh, since then, uh, NYSERT has been much more involved with um, and concerned with the um, the commercial um, uh, the commercial readiness of the companies that that we've been support for, uh, that companies whose technologies we've, we've been supporting, um, we did this for we did this for a long time, and many and we found that you know a lot of the innovation, uh, a lot of the important technologies are in fact being pursued in startup companies or in companies that uh, spin off from university uh, projects, and they get snagged. Um, when it comes to commercialization, part of this is that the you know the kind of research and development support that we provide, that SBIRs provide, and so forth, tends to support the um, uh, a technical uh, founder and uh, and the um, and the engineering staff, and there's relatively little support for the rest of the team that's actually going to build the business and do the customer discovery work and and, and all of that. So it was from that recognition that we started. You know, um, getting more and more, and finally to to the place where we uh, have this uh, co-investment fund that really provides um, 
that that really provides the means to to build out that uh, uh, the commercialization team in those cases where um, where there's a, a uh, private qualified investor that's uh, that's uh, interested uh, in in the company and that business opportunity. Um, to the second part of the question, the uh, we, we we do have a uh, a list of qualified investors online, but I think, um, which, which I'm sure is, is of interest, but I think the main thing to, to take a look at is what we, and this is nicer to speak and some of you are familiar with it. There's a, uh, what we call a program opportunity notice or PON, P-O-N, 4150. Uh, that is the co-investment fund, um, uh, solicitation. The uh, link to the uh, list of qualified investors is in that solicitation. There's a companion solicitation called uh, Request for Qualifications 4150, same number, and that, um, in responding to that Request for Qualifications, uh, allows a an investor to be considered as a qualified investor for this opportunity. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Mike. So, Abe, yeah. this next question is for you from the audience. Uh, and it's coming from a founder of an energy storage business. Uh, they're asking, you know, what are the most important milestones or metrics uh, that you like to see when companies approach you about a series seed investment? Uh, and this founder has um, uh, reference that there seems to be limited funding available for what they refer to as the valley of death uh, and he's and they're curious if um, what are the best sources of funding at that early stage for companies focused on sustainability there's a multi-part question here so th this is always a challenge and it's a good question to be asking in the in the shoes of the entrepreneur the challenge is that those metrics are different for every market and every segment um, and you have to kind of understand the nuances of that individual market as well as the history of investment within that area so energy storage can mean a lot of things in this you know it, that could be a materials company it could be a battery uh, battery uh, manufacturer, it could be a systems manufacturer, or it could be a software company focused on battery fleet management, for example. Um, and each one of those answers is a bit different. There has been a tremendous amount of investment over the last 10 years in the materials and the actual battery manufacturing side of the equation. Um, those metrics are quite difficult and actually it's uh, it has been well funded, but it's a difficult area to invest at the seed stage level, even though it is impactful and important in that those businesses tend to take a lot of capex before you can actually prove out the model even if you've got a fundamental innovation um, at the pack level i would say the the discussion is more about having a differentiated story uh, from a product and market fit perspective energy storage is different for every different application what kind of energy storage are you thinking about and at the at the kind of the fleet level it becomes more market focused, which is, okay, who cares about battery management system over a large fleet of um, of customers and batteries? And the challenges there are more about making sure you're important to that market and whether you have good customer feedback at the, at the kind of last stage. Um, on the early stage capital question, uh, the, the, probably my favorite synopsis of this, um, I don't know if many of you know, but there's uh, one of the founders of SJF Ventures, a, a gentleman named Dave Kirkpatrick, who's been one of the long-term investors in the sector. Um, he put together a, a, a LinkedIn post, uh, I think it's called Cleantech Forest, Fun, uh, Forest of Funds, a Forest of Funds and Cleantech. Um, and it's got a pretty good synopsis of the incubators, some of the non, uh, non-dilutive financing mechanisms out there like NYSERDA, um, as well as a number of the early stage and mid-stage funds. Uh, my best advice, if you're looking to try to aggregate proof points before you actually bring on institutional capital, which is always a good thing to do for you and for the capital down the road, uh, given the, the, the occasional lack of fit for this market and, and the venture model, uh, is to try to bring on that non-dilutive uh, financing earlier to try to prove things out as much as you possibly can before you bring on uh, funds and institutional capital. Um, it's easy for me to say. It's a lot harder to do as an entrepreneur. 
uh, and it is hard to navigate, which is why you're listening to things like this. Um, but you can you can find some lists out there uh, that actually kind of give you a rundown. Uh, Lacey, Greentown Labs, uh, the incubator. There's an energy incubator network that incorporates a whole host of these. EPRI has a, its own uh, incubator as well. There's a lot of places you can find some kind of pilot dollars to do first projects. Okay, great. Th thanks, Abe. Um, so, you know, one of the big steps an entrepreneur takes is as they're going into their seed or Series A or Series B financing rounds is determining which uh, funds and specifically which partners they want to, or they should be reaching uh, out to based on the strategic impact uh, that they can bring to their companies. Uh, so this question is for uh, Madison and Abe. Um, if there, once an entrepreneur has determined that congruent or EIP might be a great match for their business um, and that they want to try to partner with you, um, what is the best way for them to reach out? What should they include in that initial um, outreach? And how can they separate themselves to really stand out from all the other companies that are reaching out to you on a regular basis? Uh, Madison, why don't you start? Sure. So, you know, I think one of the things we, we, we do get a lot of, um, we do find a lot of our deals sort of through our own, you know, searches in, in different areas and kind of taking that a little methodically and reaching out to companies. Um, but we do field a lot of sort of either cold emails or, or very, you know, mildly warm emails. Um, or introductions. And I would say, you know, I think honestly, if, if, if you're reaching out and, and you feel that EIP is the right fit, we're always happy to chat with companies, even if they are, you know, too early or not necessarily the right fit for an investment, just because we have kind of a strategic lens that extends beyond just the investment. We also work a lot with our utilities and we'll, you know, oftentimes refer on companies that might not be a fit for us to invest in, but might be a good fit for a pilot program with a particular utility, um, if that sort of you know, sits in their service territory, for example, or something along those lines. Um, but I think just understanding you know, our investment thesis, we've, we've definitely published quite a bit about it publicly um, and understanding sort of where we sit with our other, with our other investments and where your, your company might either overlap or might add to the portfolio. Um, and, and might be able to kind of engage with RLPs. On that front, you know, having a great understanding uh, as best you can of EIP when you reach out kind of helps us imagine where you might sit within our, within our investment. Great, thank you. Uh, Abe? Yeah, the earliest stages are, are sometimes a little bit different. We tend to be very thinly staffed, and this is not a complaint about our lot in life, but just to give you context, you know, there are there are four of us, uh, three of us on the investing side, um, and we tend to see about a thousand deals a year. That's not unique to congruent. That's a pretty typical number you'll see, particularly in the early stages. Uh, and so the trick of the whole thing is is kind of getting out in front of the noise. Um, and so there's a couple ways to do that. If, if you're finding a way in uh, over email to us, uh, and we do look at our you know, info at congruentvc.com uh, address, the problem is, is that the signal to noise there tends to be pretty bad. So uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna try to distinguish yourself, a very short, concise email you know, with four or five bullet points about what you're doing tends to be the best way to get the hook uh, for a conversation. And you know, summary of information, what makes you unique, how you're thinking about the market, those are kind of the things that you tend to think about in those. The reality is, is because of the signal to noise ratio in general, the best way to do it is usually uh, to find a way into us. And that that's easier these days than it was 10 years ago. You know, a quick LinkedIn scrub will usually tell you who we're connected to, and we've been somebody in the shop is is probably connected to somebody you know. Um, and so again, that quick, concise email with some summary, and if you want a very short deck that doesn't have any confidential information in it, um, just asking for somebody to forward that along. Um, that that's the best way to get in. And of course, there's some other questions about you know how to actually get in front of us. We do try to attend industry conferences. Um, it's oftentimes helpful to put a name to a face. 
and so if you can afford to uh, attend conferences, that's usually a good place to meet the ecosystem as a, as a general statement. Great, thank you. Well, um, it's, it's hard to believe that it's almost been an hour since we started, as it seems we could probably continue this conversation for at least another hour. Um, I think we should move in uh, on sort of final thoughts uh, based on this discussion. Um, before getting there, there were a number of questions um, from the audience about whether the slides uh, will be shared. Uh, Katerina, we will be sharing slides, correct? Yes, uh, the slides and the recording as well. Okay, great. Um, there are a lot of questions about specific programs uh, at NYSERDA, so hopefully Mike can connect uh, offline uh, with those entrepreneurs. And there are a few about my move into uh, real estate technology, which probably aren't relevant for the broader audience, but if anyone would like to talk about that specifically, feel free to email me at connell at enertiv.com. Um, so Mike, we'll uh, kick off with you if you have any final thoughts on this discussion and how entrepreneurs can get their um, environmental, sustainable, clean tech business funded, that would be great. Yeah, so <clears throat> first off, thanks very much uh, to everyone for the opportunity to speak here. Um, anyone who wants to uh, learn more about NYSERDA programs, my email address is the same as the, the, NYSERDA, um, the NYSERDA format, michael.shimazu at nyserda.ny.gov. You can also kind of Google that online. Um, the, my, my final thoughts are, 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 are simply that as entrepreneurs, you all are very busy building your businesses. It's sometimes hard to look up and take a look around. Um, that's why I would uh, encourage you to consider um, spending uh, uh, some time connecting to uh, support and networking resources like incubators, accelerators, and, and so forth. The um, the networks uh, and introductions that that they potentially can make are, um, are are valuable and can help you propel your company forward. Uh, Mike, before we jump over to uh, Madison and Abe, uh, there were a number of questions about M Corps coming from uh, hardware focused businesses. Could you just give us the one or two line overview on that program? Sure, MCOR, um, which is a fantastic program uh, managed by my uh, colleague Erica Iannotti, uh, <clears throat> uh, pr uh, provides uh, provides uh, support to uh, companies that that uh, are uh, in the manufacturing um, uh, in a manufacturing business. Helps them to develop and understand how to how to build uh, and manage their supply chains and their um, and their design for manufacturing disciplines. Um, we have uh, two programs uh, in, in New York State. They're cohort-based. One of them is managed up in Rochester from NextCore, and the other is managed by Second Muse uh, in Brooklyn. Um, email me, and I'll, uh, I'll get you connected. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Madison, Abe, um, any final thoughts? Sure. No, I mean, you know, kind of as I mentioned earlier, we're always interested in chatting with companies in the clean tech universe, even if they don't necessarily fit our investment um, criteria at the moment, it's always great to kind of get them in our ecosystem and start talking, um, especially as a lot of our utilities are interested in leveraging earlier stage companies or many of them have their own small venture funds that, that can also potentially offer some, some funding. Um, so always happy to chat and happy to talk about you know, potential overlaps to the utility sector. Great, thank you. I guess my last comment would be, you know, as you develop your companies, I'm sure many of you do this already, but think very clearly about the milestones that you're trying to accomplish. It tends to be how the investment community thinks about companies, particularly at the early stages. What are you trying to prove and how does that help you both attract capital and attract capital at a, at a good valuation? Uh, and, and similarly, how much capital are you going to need to raise to achieve the next milestone? So as you think through what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I'd encourage you to think about that specifically. Uh, it will help you both, I think, internally with your own efforts, but also uh, talk the language of the venture community. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, this was a great discussion. Um, Katerina, did you want to share some final thoughts? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd just like to, to thank you all. Thank you, Connell, Madison, Mike, and Abe for this awesome webinar. It was a really good conversation. 
Um, thank you as well to all of you for joining us today. We hope uh, it was um, informative for everyone and insightful, and again to our invaluable partners. Um, as we mentioned uh, previously, today you're going to receive a very short survey, and uh, uh, by the end of the week, the recording of this webinar along with the slides. Um, and then early January, we will be launching our 2020 webinar series. Um, until then, and on behalf of NECEC, we'd like to wish you all happy holidays, and uh, we hope to see you again in 2020. Thank you, everyone.